So I do think, great. <laughs> so we're going to start and we have a small group um, this evening. It's the first of the class again after a four months break, actually. And uh, just before the Rains retreat, we had finished, is it the first chapter on personal training? Oh no, we'd finished two chapters. Right Understanding was the first and then Personal Training. So this is the Social and Communal Harmony book by Bhikkhu Bodhi, which is very wonderful because it basically puts all the teachings of the Buddha into certain themes. And now we're on the third theme called anger, <laughs> which is obviously something we all have to encounter unless we're enlightened or anagami already in the third stage of enlightenment. And um, like it says here, it's a defilement that's particularly disruptive to the social harmony that we're trying to cultivate through the Buddha's path. Um, really, you could say that delusion is the kind of deepest uh, problem. It's the sort of deepest cause of all our difficulties. That's why it's the first link in dependent origination, avidya, pachaya, sankara. Um, it's from delusion that everything is basically created and formed and fabricated and this whole mass of suffering begins but um of course it's through delusion that we have greed and through delusion that we have anger because we're only harming ourselves with both um, responses to life and to situations that we encounter um, but of course it's very hard to undermine delusion directly and so we can work on these other things first. And um, Ashram Pramali always says it's great to work with anger because it's the most disruptive and it's the, in a sense, the easiest to start to wear away. First of all, it's a very coarse emotion, isn't it? I mean, when you get angry, you can't really mistake it. Although it is possible to have a kind of internalized anger which comes about through depression, it manifests in depression or maybe a lot of sadness, maybe you know milder forms of anger like irritation, frustration, impatience. Yeah. But it's usually quite obvious, it makes us feel miserable straight away. There's not really much of a reward to it, although there is some kind of reward. <clears throat> and in uh, the suttas, it actually says that it has a poisoned root and a honeyed tip which means sometimes it can be tempting to feel anger because you can like vent, you can let your frustration out on others. For that moment, you feel powerful, you feel strong, I won't put up with this, you know? It's other people's fault. Um, but it has a poison fruit and as such, it's coming from delusion, it's coming from aversion. And therefore it can never bring about beautiful, wholesome results. I know that some people who are involved in things like um, working against climate catastrophe or, you know, for social justice, feel that anger is an important motivational force for them. And I think, you know, that may be true to a degree in the sense that we have to feel passionate about something or passionately against something in order to, you know, take action and, and um, work for change. But if anger is the main motivation, you're going to burn out very quickly. It's not really going to lead to a long-term lasting peace. Perhaps it will bring about change in the outside world to a degree, but you'll be less effective because you will burn out. And you'll be the one that suffers as a result of that anger. So I really think it's, it's interesting to me when people say, or when I've said previously that I don't think anger is the best way to go about it, because some people react to that and say, you know, we shouldn't stigmatize our emotions. And that's really true. But how is it that we never think of compassion as a strong enough motivational force? Like, cannot compassion also be fiery? Can't it be passionate? Can't it be strong, you know, and empowering and emboldening for the mind? So when we can purify that anger, you know, by observing it, by perhaps allowing it in, welcoming it in, understanding it, but then allowing it to dissolve, you know, and give way to something deeper, because often underneath that anger, there's a sadness, or there is a fear, and those emotions are very much connected to compassion, you know, compassion is almost a natural response when we experience suffering. So there's a lot more I could say about anger, but... 
I would really like to get into the suttas that are presented in this uh, wonderful book and look at dealing with anger. So as I said, last time we met, we were just at the end of the second chapter on personal training and we just finished um, discussing metta, metta bhavana, the practice of loving kindness. And I think it's quite nice that we're now going into anger because, of course, one of the main purposes of loving kindness meditation is to overcome, is an antidote to that anger. Yeah. When I say the word overcome, um, it's important not to see that as a kind of bypassing. Right. We're not trying to like get past anger to experiencing something better. It's more understanding that anger and learning to meet it, first of all, with kindness. And through that, the attitude we have towards an emotion actually starts to change the nature of that emotion. It's like when you love your anger, <laughs> when you embrace your anger, it doesn't really have a lot of power over you anymore. So the anger, it's almost like this little child that just wants some attention, <laughs> you know, making a fuss. I don't want it that way. And then, you, oh, it's OK, you know, give you some love. And after a while, oh, it just relaxes. So this is the way to overcome. We don't push it aside. So it's probably a good uh, thing to note before we go into these, uh, the particular language used here, because it's fairly strong language. It's about slaying anger and killing anger. And I think in a way those words are chosen because they're in line with the idea of anger. And actually what the Buddha is doing is contrasting um, the right, the wrong kind of killing. Yeah. So he's using a play on words like anger can cause you to physically kill. But here we're saying the best kind of killing is killing the anger itself. So it's a little bit of a play on words. It doesn't mean you go in there and kind of, you know, fight the anger with your willpower or with aversion that only makes double suffering. Yeah. So we don't want to increase our suffering by responding with more. So are there any questions, first of all, before we start, or are you all eager to get into the suttas? Any questions or comments? Because this is actually not a Dhamma talk, it's a sutta discussion group. So it would be really, really nice to hear from you. And especially if you have been practicing metta, loving kindness, and have some experience with working with anger or some difficulties, you know, around it. Uh, you maybe have some tips to share or some advice that you'd like to ask either to me or to the group. So that's just a general invitation for the whole of this session. And just to remind everybody that um, although we record the session, <clears throat> your video will not show. So it'll only record your voice. And if you don't want your voice to be recorded, if you want to say something and, you know, be completely anonymous, you can just pop it in the chat box to either everyone or either or even just to myself. Yeah. So it's all confidential. Great. So here we go. The slaying of anger. And this is from the Samyutta 1121. Saka, ruler of the devas, approached the blessed one, paid homage to him, stood to one side and addressed the blessed one in verse. You've got a little poem here. Having slain what, does one sleep soundly? Having slain what, does one not sorrow? What is the one thing, O Gotama, whose killing you approve? And then... Gautama, the Buddha, the Blessed One, answers. Having slain anger, one sleeps soundly. Having slain anger, one does not sorrow. The killing of anger, O Saka, with its poisoned root and honeyed tip, this is the killing the noble ones praise. For having slain that, one does not sorrow. So it's a very simple little verse. Thanks, Gunther. He's written the full place that you can uh, look that up in the Samyutta Nikaya. Um, it's simple, but it immediately speaks of a couple of great benefits you can get, right? To sleep soundly or not to sorrow. Yeah. You also are praised by the noble ones. If you uh, kill your anger, to use that sort of turn of phrase, 
but you know anybody who's practicing on this path and who is sincerely working to overcome suffering basically the things that cause us to suffer the particular patterns unwholesome patterns of our mind is praiseworthy right so you sleep soundly and you do not sorrow once you've destroyed anger it's interesting because that's very similar to metta isn't it that's one of the benefits of metta and one of the synonyms for metta is avyapada which actually means non-ill will or non-anger so they are actually almost one and the same. Some people, some teachers say it's enough, you know, just to work on undermining the defilements. I still haven't found a better word for that. I don't like the word defilement because it just sounds so sort of moralistically judgmental somehow. <laughs> and it sounds really bad, really dirty, you know, and almost sinful, doesn't it? Especially if you maybe come from a Christian background, but... Uh, Maybe we could call them, you could actually call them just obscurations of the mind or um, it, because it is one of the hindrances. So um, if I use the word defilement, just, yeah, it's just because I haven't come to a better uh, translation of that just yet. Um, so it's very similar. And you can either work on the anger or you can practice the loving kindness. Some people say if you're working to undermine you know, anger, ill will, impatience, irritation. You don't need to practice metta because the natural state of the mind will be to abide in loving kindness and compassion. But I think we can really, you know, improve and speed up the process and also make it a lot, lot more joyful for ourselves and everyone else if we actually cultivate the opposites, cultivate the beautiful qualities as well. And I know in the forest tradition in particular, the Thai forest tradition, they don't really do that very much. In Myanmar, they do. You know, they have a lot of meta practices. And maybe based on the Visuddhimagga, there's quite a lot of detail there about, you know, spreading metta to uh, cultivating it, first of all, with the four kinds of uh, beings, the four groups of beings, as we have done in our ongoing classes. So the loved person or the benefactor, the neutral person, um, and the person that we don't like very much, right, the enemy. Uh, so in the Visuddhimagga, there's a lot of instruction on that. Whereas in the suttas, you only hear about spreading metta in the four directions. But I think that this gives you a step-by-step -step way to actually reach that point. And um, it's very much a part of my practice. It always has been. So from the beginning in the Vipassana tradition, we were always advised to do our two hours every day of meditation, an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. And at the end of that um, hour sit to spread loving kindness for the last five, 10 minutes. And it's really a beautiful habit to get into because then you feel like your practice is not just for you. It doesn't matter if you've become more peaceful, if you've got into this or that state, or even if you've just sat there feeling upset, at least you've turned up to practice. And at the end you share metta with all beings so there's always a point to meditation there's always something that you can give to others through that so are there any questions or comments on this particular verse has anybody noticed that they don't sleep well for example when they're angry <laughs> oh Gunter, you're doing the q a is it you have to unmute yourself <laughs> I thought I unmuted me now. Uh, Melanie, if you could. Yes, I was wondering why um, it says uh, anger has a honeyed tip, because to my experience, when when I feel angry, I'm I don't I don't feel this honeyed tip, and I I think it's it's a very um, an easy and um, difficult situation to be with, to be with. So it's mm -hmm. not sweet at all. Or maybe yeah. it's a translation I don't understand. Right. I mean, personally, I think it's better not to experience any kind of um, gratification in anger. I actually think that's more aligned to the nature of anger. It's unpleasant, as you say. It burns. Right. It feels hot. It feels constricting you feel like your heart race or your stomach kind of turn into knots <laughs> I remember one lady got angry with me once in um, an Ayurveda class actually I was studying 
in London Ayurvedic medicine and uh, she was angry because me and my friend we used to ask all the questions and I don't know why that bothered her but um, she was speaking to me afterwards I think I was speaking to her saying you know maybe try to kind of give us the benefit of the doubt a bit and she had like her whole face and chest became bright red bright red with this anger it was really interesting to watch it rise up but then as I spoke to her and said you know maybe it your perception of what our motivation is maybe not quite true and I could see it then start to come down again and the skin color changed back to normal it was really interesting um so yeah I actually think that's probably a good thing that you experience it as suffering and it may then help you put the brakes on but unfortunately I think some people do experience it as a kind of rush like adrenaline and maybe that's when they have a lot of anger or, you know, trauma, maybe or unprocessed emotions inside. Maybe they're really, you know, really in a bad way in life. And the anger just gives them at least a sense that they're alive, you know. Um, and I think for some people, too, like when they express that or kind of vent that on others, they feel a temporary relief. It's like I told them, you know. I showed them I won't be pushed about or whatever. And there's a sort of quick relief, maybe especially if they've suppressed a lot before, right? It's like you have this fire inside and it's burst out, so you feel temporarily relieved, but you haven't dealt with the root, you haven't dealt with the problem. And so that relief doesn't last very long. So I think the fact that it says a honey tip means it's a very short, you know, time that it may feel like a relief or something. Um, I mean, I'm like you, I don't think it's a relief, but I don't have a lot of suppressed anger either. Um, so I think it, it, what it's referring to is that there might be a short period where it feels like a good idea, but afterwards you really suffer and you regret it, you know. So I hope that makes some sense, but it's good to ask these things because there's no right or wrong reason or answer it's maybe something to contemplate and observe, you know, because there are people in this world that run on anger, right? They run on hate. I mean, look what's happening in countries like Myanmar. It's just, it's basically genocide, I think, at this point. And there's something in it for those people, even if they're incredibly deluded. Still, they're making that choice day after day. Maybe it's not really a choice, but yeah. Another question? Um, Mira, if you could uh, unmute and speak, thank you. Um, I was thinking about anger as a power play. When, when you're angry, you make other people fear you. you yeah. You're on the right side. And I think um, the root of this is a lack of self-compassion. You can't love yourself so you, you need an enemy to fight against the, the lack of love in yourself. So it's, it's really a, a tricky one because the angry people, they uh, hate, hate to love in a way. Yeah. It, and it shows them that um, it's, it's the fear to love. Yes. Hate, hate is the fear to love because love is seen as a kind of um, weakness. Yes, to love yes. is to be weak. Right. And, and, and yes. there, there are whole whole bunches of people who share through the anger because they feel safe in a group yes, that's very yes. angry. Yes. It's on the left side is on the right side. Both both of them. Yeah. <laughs> so I think um, the, the the main thing is really this lack of self compassion. Perhaps it's sometimes self pity. Right. I'm a poor one, I'm, I'm surrounded by enemies, I've got to fight them because they're wrong. Yeah. And whole ideologies play with this power play. So many people who are very insecure, they go to groups that, they, that give them the possibility to fuel their anger and to feel proud and to feel... Um, uh, important? Important and... Um, Ah, it's the, the word that um, vulnerable. They they don't want to be vulnerable. Yes, yes, so yes. So they, they have the, the power. We yeah. we're gonna make it with our anger. And the world is a place that we need to be angry because right. it's, it's a place full of enemies. 
Yes, and it's and a place it's, that's hurt them. Yeah, that's that's the thing. So it's very difficult to say, okay, you must love yourself. Of course, I love myself. But deep down, deep yeah. down in, in the midst of this all, there's perhaps only self-pity, but no self-compassion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I think about anger also, and it fuels your uh, your self-esteem. Yeah. I know what's wrong, so you don't. And uh, I know many people, uh, not many, but, but sometimes I, I walk a lot around the streets and have some little, little chats with the people in the neighborhood. And there's an old lady, she's about 82 of age, and I'm, I'm just thinking, okay, she's always angry, always, always, always. And um, I must say, I play sometimes a little game for myself with her. I say really nice things and I think, okay, what she's gonna find? I say, okay, perhaps um, there's a nice weather. Yes, but there's a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Always the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's like like really um, very, very narrow-minded and mm. it's, um, it's an uh, attitude and a habitude. Yeah. I don't know with 82 if she comes out of this again. Yeah, it's an identity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As an identity. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. There's yeah, so much insight you. there. Mm. So much insight. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, um, yeah, I wanted to sort of uh, agree, really, but you expressed it so beautifully. But the part about, um, you know, anger as a substitute or as a, a kind of shield against feeling vulnerable, right? Or against the hurt that you've experienced in life. So you become armored. The heart becomes armored and it's like you imagine that everybody's against you all the time it's it's actually an imagination that's why it's so deluded sometimes you know because we create a world that makes us angry like you said and then we respond to that imaginary world and we're doing this all the time with anger with greed with whatever you know we're just creating these worlds that we then find ourselves in and it's really hard to get out. And I think the other point is that, you know, it becomes an identity. I am the one that was wronged, you know. I am the one that needs to fight against the world. And so I think one of the reasons we're attached to anger is that it gives us a sense of self. And it's better to have an angry self than to be nothing, than to not know what to do or where you belong, right? So I think this is one reason, like you say, that people join, you know, maybe sects or cults or, you know, fundamentalist groups, because it gives them a sense of belonging somewhere. Right? And then, yeah, like they feel more uh, powerful that way. So it's, uh, but the other thing also that I think you were touching on is, um, you know, the self-compassion, the, the lack of self-compassion. And I do think a lot of anger is actually internalized towards ourself. Yeah. I mean, for me, that tends to be how it goes, you know. If something goes wrong, I think, oh, I must have done something. Like even tiny little things, like what was it this evening? Something very tiny. Uh, oh, yeah, that I was, there's a cat here, and the cat's actually really sweet, and actually I'm allergic to cats, but I was stroking her. And uh, she seemed to really enjoy it. And she was getting quite close to me and trying to get on my knee. And then at some point, she just like tried to scratch me and then showed her teeth. So then I thought, oh, I don't know if I should tell the owner. But later, I, I sort of mentioned it. And she said, oh, yeah, that's what she's like. You better tell all the, anyone who visits you that, you know, that's what she's like. Whereas I thought it was me. I thought I must have done something wrong, you know. So I think a lot of the time, and that's a small, tiny example, but I just noticed, isn't that interesting that I took responsibility for the angry cat, you know? <laughs> and I think sometimes, yeah, a lot of anger is actually anger towards ourself, you know? I should have done it differently. Things went wrong because I made a stupid mistake. And, you know, uh, and in that sense, it's also a lack of self-compassion, yeah. Was there a question from Shirley or a comment that Shirley wanted to make before we move on? Do you want to unmute? Well, I think it's, I was inspired to say something when Mira was talking because I just thought it was so wise and I thought she should be doing some work with uh, terrorists really because... <laughs> You know, <laughs> understood where they're. Um, I mean, not that I want her to be attacked by terrorists, but <laughs> I think 
<laughs> she understands where that hatred's coming from because it's the marginalized yeah. and the weak that get um, sucked into these these organizations. And um, I think it's just, and it's something I learned as a fostering social worker about naughty, angry children are hurting. Yeah. yeah it's not that they're naughty, and, and this applies to adults, yeah. this applies to us. Uh, it's because we're hurting and which is why self-compassion is and also compassion not weakness but compassion to to because it just it just breeds more anger and it was just like 9 11 and every day said we'll all stand together against the terrorists and go to and you could I, I thought oh my god I could see what was going to happen and it was just going to inflame more mm. and more terrorist attacks because yeah. no preparedness to understand where all that hatred was coming from and what was fueling it yeah the thing yeah. Is, all these emotions are within us maybe not acted out i'm sure none of us would act all these things out so 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 strongly and I think this this attitude of kindfulness that Ajahn Brahm teaches, I don't do a lot of formal meta practice anymore, but all my meditation is actually an act of being kindness to whatever comes up mm. in, 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 my, in my mind and body. And I think it's uh, made me a happier person. Yeah. But this self-compassion is, and this compassion and as the Buddha said, hatred never ceases by hatred, only by love alone. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I just wanted to thank Mira and all the other things you added to it, Sandra, and that's just my little bit. It's mm. So rich, so rich. Thank you, thank you. Just to add to that, I think this is what you were saying, but just to make it more explicit, you know, by seeing that when people are angry it's because they're hurting that does engender us to feel compassion towards them doesn't it it helps us to feel compassion towards them and that obviously cuts the cycle of hatred leading to hatred so instead of responding with anger or with fear we can just understand that yeah this person's suffering and like you say Shirley we all have it inside us we know how that feels too we might not act it out although sometimes we will um but we know how it feels and i think it's important to recognize you know even if you don't think you're an angry person we act it out on ourselves you know we put ourselves down all the time i mean everybody does it you know like the lady i'm staying with now she parked somewhere and it, i think it wasn't quite the right what, what was it she forgot something anyway oh stupid woman she said to herself and i immediately saw that you know she's a compassionate person right but we're so so ingrained to just attack ourselves we're so used to it we don't even think that we're attacking ourselves but it's really not you know loving kind speech jane jane could you unmute? yeah I, yeah just adding to what everybody else is saying i think what's coming to my mind is how close that there, that there isn't just one type of anger as we're talking and giving different examples, I think I'm thinking anger isn't just one thing, mm. nor is it synonymous with hatred. Mm. I think there are lots of different emotions that go into to anger and some are more poisonous than others. Mm. And in some angers, some aspects, it's very close to tears. It's very, 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 it's almost the same thing as crying. Yeah. And there's that end of anger, which just feels like a big weep. Um, <laughs> and then there's the more poisonous, revengeful, hard, very hard hearted thing mm -hmm. that you were talking about as an example, you know, revenge for terrorist atrocities where someone takes more like a, a head-based cold decision. Yeah. But that's only one type. I think there are lots of different angers, ways of being angry and feelings 
and motivations for being angry. And some are very soft and very tearful and very fragile. And I think I wouldn't want to say to my children or people around me, don't be angry. I think I'd rather talk about diverting anger or even letting it out and then seeing what happens afterwards. And I, I say that as somebody who parents adoptive children who feel a lot of rage. Um, my middle daughter still has a lot of rage around her adoption. And, you know, I won't say to her, don't be angry. That's what's going on in my head at the moment. I wouldn't, that's, that would be really harmful. She yeah. needs to be angry. Mm. And I need to be big enough to hold her anger mm. and let her be angry. Mm. And that's my love gift to her mm. is that ability to be a safe place for her mm. to be angry. Um, but my job with her, I think, is to steer that anger, which is why I've got this idea of diverting it, you know, mm. sort of steering it away from its most damaging course. And to a place where it's almost like it's an energy that needs to come out. And only after that energy is out, can she then listen? Can she then yeah. feel some other emotions that are softer, yeah. gentler, more vulnerable? We talked about vulnerability. And the anger for her is very much about not wanting, as you said, and as other people said, not wanting to feel. She, mm. she doesn't want to go to where it hurts. So she feels angry. But if I said to her, don't be angry, that wouldn't help. So the anger has to come. And after it's come, then a softness can happen, especially mm. if I've sat with her through it, you know? So yeah. I suppose that's my contribution, really, that I, rather than saying that all anger is bad, yeah, yeah. I think I just want to add a role, you know? some space for a role that it has that's natural yeah mm. natural mm. i'm not saying it's good i'm not making a value judgment but i'm saying it's natural and as yeah. something that's natural it ne like 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 an avalanche it just needs to happen you know it's got to come out it's got to come down and you see how the landscape settles after um yeah that's sort of what i wanted to say yeah Thank you. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I could feel in myself a kind of almost a longing actually for that kind of healthy holding space for anger, because I think in my family, it was very much a kind of don't be angry. And it was definitely stigmatized. Mm. Um, I did let my anger out as a teenager <laughs> in certain ways. <laughs> quite a few ways mainly through singing really loud rock songs but also sometimes I would throw things at the wardrobe I threw a bottle at the wardrobe once and it actually went through the wardrobe and there's still there was a hole like this in the wall <laughs> like the, the top of it went through like this but yeah it was definitely seen as you know you were bad if you were angry and underneath it was actually a kind of despair like a kind of mm. what am I doing here you know why doesn't anyone talk about life and what it means and what's happening and why I feel terrible as a teenager <laughs> yeah um so that's and, important isn't it yeah, absolutely for you those emotions and to be able to have those emotions were part of the journey of exploration to totally. take it, to get to the next point you almost yeah. have to go through that yeah. don't you absolutely you yeah point. and yeah. I guess that's what I'm saying you can't leap from that stage absolutely not no because that's what we call spiritual bypass I actually think it should just be called some kind of psychological bypass because there's nothing spiritual about it right I mean if the job of the path is to open our heart to every experience to understand and you use the word nature and I think that's a beautiful word it's a translation of the word dhamma actually like mm -hmm. dhamma can mean nature there's no good or bad it's just nature cause and effect right um then of course we have to open our heart to everything that arises that's the only way we can really have um empathy to others who are experiencing the same things and empathy to ourselves you know 
So I think that's beautiful, really wonderful parenting. And yeah, I mean, I'd love to unpack it even more and ask about, you know, how you managed to, you know, skillfully help her to divert that. But um, it seems like most of the healing is just in that holding non-judgmental space. It yeah. is. It's very important to mm. do that for her. Mm. And mm. It takes, I think patience is the other thing because, yeah. and also your own heart has to be brave enough to stay steady yeah. and not take it personally because as an adoptive mum mm. as well, um, to be able to stand and be okay with what comes your way so it's it's yeah there were yeah. lots of is there just lots of things coming together but I think what I learned was if you just keep keep going back and don't take it personally and just keep going back and holding the space that is love I think honestly I think that beautiful is love. so beautiful yeah especially that part about like holding the space but not making it about you really being there for her mm -hmm. this is this is really love yeah yeah absolutely yeah beautiful it's quite moving well done I agree with what Shirley said your daughter's so fortunate to have you for her mom <laughs> that's very kind <laughs> oh. wow this is great I learned so much it's beautiful and it's interesting, isn't it, how all of this ties so closely to the Buddha's teachings, you know, the part about, I think also, Jane, one thing you might not have mentioned, but you did mention sort of um, in a, in a um, implied way was the understanding that it will pass, you know, the yeah. understanding that this isn't permanent, you know, it's something she's going to go through, it's going to reach its peak, and then it's going to kind of slowly de-escalate. And um, keeping that in mind as you hold the space will help to keep that steadiness and that patience, I think. And that's one of the insights, isn't it, that we learn as Buddhists, you know, everything is impermanent. And it's not, oh, it's impermanent, therefore we don't care about it. It's no, we can care even more while it's there, you know, whether it's good or bad, because it won't last either way. And then this part about not identifying with any of this, not identifying with what your daughter's going through, not identifying with you know, this makes me bad or good or it shouldn't happen. If I'm a good mom, she should always be happy, you know, <laughs> because it's just out of our control. That's part of non-self. You know, we can't control nature. Everything arises due to cause and effect. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Any last comments on at this point? They don't have to be last comments. I'm sure we can have further discussion. Yeah, it's all good. Shall we continue with the sutta? Actually, it's interesting, Jane, because I think, was it Jane? I think it was you that said there's different kinds of anger, yes. Because the very next sutta talks about that, actually. And again, it's not really making it a personal thing. I think what it's doing is it's talking about people's tendencies. So some people may tend to be this way or tend to be that way. But it's also talking about different ways that anger can manifest, you know. So in this, the Buddha talks. Uh, anyway, I'll just read it. So it's called the three kinds of persons, but you could also see it as the three kinds of anger. Monastics, there are these three kind of persons found existing in the world. What three? Number one, a person who is like a line etched in stone. The person who's like a line etched in the ground. And the person who's like a line etched in water. And what kind of person is like a line etched in stone? Here, some person often gets angry and their anger persists for a long time. Just as a line etched in stone is not quickly erased by the wind and water, but persists for a long time. This is called a person who is like a line etched in stone. And what kind of person is like a line etched in the ground? Here, some person often gets angry, but their anger does not persist for a long time. Just as a line etched in the ground is quickly erased by the wind and water and does not persist for a long time, 
So too, some person often gets angry, but their angry, anger does not persist for a long time. This is called the person who's like a line etched in the ground. And what kind of person is like a line etched in water? Can you etch a line in water? <laughs> Here, some person, even when spoken to roughly and harshly, in disagreeable ways, remains on friendly terms with their antagonist, mingles with them and greets them. <laughs> Just as a line etched in water quickly disappears and does not persist for a long time, so too some person, even when spoken to roughly and harshly, in disagreeable ways, remains on friendly terms with their antagonist, mingles with them and greets them. This is called the person who's like a line etched in water. These monastics are the three kinds of persons, or anger, <laughs> found existing in the world. And that's from Anguttara 3, 1, 3, 2. And it's already in the chat box. Fabulous. So that's quite interesting because I'm sure we all have sometimes all of those things, some angers that, you know, in our lives that persist and that become resentments, become ingrained. Um, you know, sometimes we get angry often, but it doesn't last. And other times, you know, it just doesn't affect us. I think we can be all these three. <laughs> and it's interesting because this kind of sort of can look as though it's saying one's bad, one's good. But if you look at it, it actually never says that. I think we add that on. I think we add a value judgment onto many of these things. Um, it's simply a description. But uh, I think it's a very beautiful sutta. And I, actually, I hadn't read it for a while. I just scanned it before we came in. But, uh, you know, I like how the line etched in water is uh, not just that the anger doesn't really stay, but that it goes the opposite way. You actually can mingle with the person who's caused you to feel angry or spoken to you in unpleasant, disagreeable ways and greet that person as well. So isn't this wonderful? You know, and in a way, that's, I think, what Jane was saying a little bit, because at that moment, you know, sometimes I'm sure that your daughter might take it out on you a bit and, you know, um, but you're still able to stay present and greet your daughter and, you know, be around her. It's more than just mingling. It's giving your life to her care. So this is very wonderful. And I think this becomes more and more possible the Actually, for me, it becomes more possible the more I'm able to process my feelings as they arise, you know, rather than let them build and kind of fester. I think that's, that is really important and, and quite healthy, I feel. And I think it's the practice, you know, especially for me anyway, one of the most helpful things to work with my emotions, whatever they are, is to go back to the body, go back to the sensations in the body and feel what's happening. Sometimes sensations can be more physical than emotional. You know, a lot of the most coarse ones are just sort of aches and pains and, you know, maybe pressure, throbbing, whatever it is, tightness or kind of picking sensations. But then there's also subtler feelings that are still in the body. They're still detectable in physically, but very obviously related to our emotional world. And in my retreat, over the last few months, it was uh, really interesting to look at some of the strong emotions that I hadn't experienced for a very long time, like some really strong emotions like uncertainty, even despair, and a kind of, I think some of it was hormones. I'm getting to be ooh, a bit old. <laughs> and I could see it was related, you know, to the time in the month. And um, some of it was just a kind of dark feeling, you know, a kind of inner, like, ooh. And at first it can be hard to detect how that's arising in the body. But after a while, I was like noticing it was usually around the heart area. And there was like, unless there was an intention to really stay with it, the mind was sort of bouncing off and just trying to like carry on as normal. It would just bounce off those areas. But once I started to like intentionally open to it, it was very interesting and it kind of fairly quickly dissolved. Not that that's the aim, that it fairly quickly dissolves. And it doesn't always. But um, it, it's just really interesting that it's often when we meet these things that there's a shift. You know, that it's almost like they are crying out to be seen. They just need to be noticed and met with that kindness. 
And once, you know, we can meet them and some understanding can arise that, oh, this is maybe unpleasant, this is suffering, this is also impermanent and it isn't mine, you know, it's a phenomena that's arisen at this moment. And of course, I was noticing how it was being built by certain types of thinking. And when, you know, those kind of thoughts subsided and I could just stay present with the feeling, it would uh, start to defabricate or dissolve, start to disappear. So I think seeing that conditioned nature is also part of non-self, you know, understanding um, how anger arises and how it's perpetuated, how it's built yeah, in the context of anger. I mean, for me, it was more, yeah, I mean, they are emotions, I think, related to aversion, related to negativity, despair, depression. It's kind of on that very obvious suffering side of things. Um, so that was really interesting. Hmm. I was thinking earlier, actually, that there was sort of, I mean, this is just one way of conceptualizing it, but I was thinking there's like four steps in meeting anger or four different ways that we can work with it. Apparently it's good to have numbers like three ways or four ways, maybe it stays in people's mind. <laughs> and the first one was like, this is for kind of coarser anger and just, you know, to ensure that we protect ourselves and our virtue. So the first one could be seen as restraint, yeah, restraint. A bit like Jane saying, diverting it, it's kind of restraining, yeah. Not acting on it, not denying it, but not acting on it, not speaking with ill will, not, you know, behaving with ill will, not punching someone. <laughs> to be very coarse and then so there's restraint and then there's reflection and Ajahn Brahmali talks about this a lot this is the main thrust of his teaching I would say he talks a lot about reflecting on the dangers of anger or you know lust or whatever it is that's you know causing you suffering and you know looking at the other side of the person looking at the other side of the situation in a different light so we can reflect as well, you know, maybe not when anger's present, it might be harder, but certainly in our free time, in our spare time, so that these things don't become like lines etched in stone, right? You, you don't allow a very negative perception of another person to persist. You intentionally look for good in that person, look for the good things, you know, or, or look, if you can't see the good things, look for the suffering, the suffering that person may be going through and generate compassion. So restraining, reflecting, and then the third one is mindfulness, right? That's what I just spoke about, the mindfulness of the, it can be of the emotion itself, but that's very abstract. So I always feel it's much easier and more effective to work in the body in an embodied way. And you're not missing very much that way either. You feel it very quickly, almost as soon as it arises, especially if your mind is you know, used to being quite present to this whole physical phenomena. You can feel if your stomach suddenly goes, ooh, you know, or if you suddenly feel hot or your heart starts to kind of pound, whatever it is. Well, I don't know how else people experience anger, but yeah, sometimes I feel it more like a sinking sort of feeling, like I'm, I'm going down a negative pathway in my mind. You know, the thoughts are getting increasingly negative. That can happen when we're tired too. So however it manifests, but see if you can, you know, notice it right away. And then the last one is understanding. And as I say, that arises as a result of mindfulness, right? So we see that these things have a cause, they arise, they pass. They stay for a while, but not that long. And uh, they don't belong to us. They're conditioned, completely conditioned by the situation, by the conditioning that we've had. You know, if, if all you've ever learned is anger in your life, then that's going to be the way you work until somebody else comes along, like a wise friend or a teacher, and they show you a different way. So, and then, of course, yeah, the impermanence, the non-self, and the sheer suffering of it, right? Sometimes we really don't want to suffer, but we also don't want to look at the suffering in the eye. We find all kinds of ways to distract ourselves, you know, anything just not to feel what I feel. And actually it's when you meet it and feel it that you can start to understand that it's nature and the power is taken away. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to suffer. It's okay to feel the way you feel. You know, there is a, a point to it and it's to develop understanding and wisdom. 
So yeah, restraint, reflection, mindfulness and understanding. That's just one way that came to my mind, or well, four ways, I guess, that we can uh, perhaps use to work with these emotions. <laughs> Not to eradicate, to work with. <laughs> So it's now 10 past eight and the next suit is quite long. So is there anything to discuss around this? I think there's quite a lot to it and maybe people would identify with one or the other or share some experience around one or the other. Great, you're very talkative today. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet just to check first because sometimes some people are a little slower to raise their hand or they may take longer to get the confidence. You can also put something in the chat box if you wish and I'll come to that as well. Uh, otherwise we'll go with... Mira? Mira. Can, I, can you unmute please? Um, as James said, uh, there's an avalanche of anger and all the remedies you just said now, it's, it's the gap between the, the impulse and the reaction. And you have to have the capability or possibility yeah. to find this gap. Yes. And it's just really, really, really very difficult when you're an angry person who's set in stone because yeah. there's no possibility to find a gap. Mm. It's, it's just like that. So I, I don't know <laughs> what is possible to do. And anger is, is always also about, about the self. Yeah. And the gap is the non-self. So just to, to little, what I think is it's yeah. just to have, have the possibility to step back for a little yeah. moment only. And yeah. this, is, this is so, so difficult with anger because there's very much energy in it. Yeah. Very much energy in it. And to put some, some breaks in it, it sometimes fuels the energy. Right. Yeah, so it's a tricky kind of thing. Um, I, I don't know, I have not these this, uh, experiences with uh, teenagers who would have avalanches of anger. <laughs> and I, I know I couldn't cope with it because I'm too <laughs> fearful for that. Mm. You have to ve be very courageous and very strong in, in your vision of how holding this. Mm. Mm. And, and it's a very, very courageous uh, way to deal with people who are very angry and we have no possibilities to step back a little. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Th thanks for everyone who, who does it. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I wanted to, that's, that is Thank what you. I wanted to share. Thank you. That's Thank something. you. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks to you, because you surely do it. I mean, the fact that you've identified that there's a gap between, you know, uh, anything that arises and the mind that's watching um, shows that you understand there is that gap. And yeah, you could see that gap as a sort of space of non-self. That would be, you know, awareness with a lot of wisdom. Or it could just be a gap or a kind of relational field, right? That there's a choice there like there's something between you and what arises in other words there's a relationship that is not set in stone <laughs> um and it might be true that uh people who are set in stone don't see the gap it could also be that when you don't see the gap it becomes set in stone it could be both ways <laughs> but i do believe that you can always change it so i would sort of like to think that it's because perhaps they haven't realized there's a gap like they've identified so strongly that it becomes so set. And as soon as we can actually see that anger is a phenomena, right? Which is why I think it's helpful to see it in the physical body, because you see it's a phenomena, it's this thing that comes <laughs> and you can get some kind of handle on it. And then you can notice, oh, I'm seeing it now. Like I'm actually observing it now. Like maybe another way to help people is to actually, if somebody's just venting, just to say, so. How do you feel right now? Like what, what uh, not just how do you feel in an abstract way, but like, uh, are your hands hot or cold? You know, make it actually physical and get them in their body. Because often the anger, we think it's towards a person, but it's actually towards the feelings we're experiencing at a deeper level. That's what we're angry with. We feel bad and we blame something else, someone else. We're actually angry with the way we feel. So I do think there's some leeway there. 
but uh, it's interesting what you said about um, fear, fear around people who are angry, because I still have that. And I've never actually turned it around and thought that maybe my mom was a bit scared when I was like that, because I thought that I was not scary. <laughs> I thought I was just like not getting the attention I wanted or needed, but maybe it was quite intimidating. Yeah. It can be helpful to just realize that person just hurts. Actually, two days ago, we went to Stroud to look for some properties and uh, the person taking me around parked the car outside somebody's house. And this old man came running out of the house. No, you can't park here, private private but really loudly like re well not loudly but very angry you know he was just shooing us away and uh and we just sort of said oh is it is it private oh we, we only want to stay here a while and he was still kind of and then I went right up to him I mean he was an old man and he wasn't very intimidating to be honest but I just really saw that there was fear a lot of fear and wondering who we were and I said you know um we're just I just explained exactly what we were doing. So I said, it's just that we've got friends in that house next to, you know, next to you. And um, I just want to have my lunch there. And then my friend will come and pick me up again. Is that okay? How long? How long? I said, well, not more than one hour. One hour? One hour. Okay. One hour. And then at one point he said, I can't hear you because he was actually quite deaf. So I realized that was the other reason he was kind of scared and afraid. Like, who are these strange people? So I was like, oh, sorry, we'll just be one hour, you know. And then by the end, I mean, he didn't exactly smile, but he definitely looked like, OK, OK. And I imagine he would have gone back in the house and perhaps thought, yeah, maybe I laid it on a bit and maybe people are not that bad after all, you know. It was definitely, I think, a fear thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt like he'd probably been really isolated. I mean, everybody's been really isolated and just, you know, he may already have been even before COVID. Um, so, yeah, sometimes it's really good to just also protect yourself. Right. I don't want to say like always walk into a situation where somebody's obviously angry because maybe I wouldn't have done that if it was, I don't know, some huge guy with, I don't know, looking really, looking in the stereotypical way of what I think an angry person looks like. <laughs> so I do think we should protect ourselves when there's, you know, when we, sometimes it's instinctive, isn't it? Like you perceive there could be a real risk and you don't have to override your intuition. You know, it's always better to play it safe, I think. Yeah. So, um, Jane. Hi. Two things were in my in my mind when you were reading that. The one was, you know, the thing about the line in wood. You said the first type of anger, and you said, and in when you were reading that, the thing that came into my head was from the um, Meta Sutta by not holding to fixed views. Oh yeah, the, the pure-hearted one through clarity of vision. Blah blah blah. You know, and but that line felt like a fixed view. It yeah. felt very fixed. So the one type, so one of the um, issues that makes us angry is that we get very sure that we know what the situation is or what mm. the facts of the matter are. And we get angry because of that. Mm. And it's, I found it really, really helpful to ask myself, do I really know that for sure about anything? Do yeah. I really know? Is that really true? Am I yeah. really sure that that is true? And if I go through that, you know, Katie Byron's got this amazing book. And if I go through that whole process of going, Jane, do you really know that? Are you 100% sure that is the fact of the matter? Then that line that is in that word becomes a bit more like a line in sand. Mm. It starts to shift. And so not everyone is open to being asked that because that can make people angry if you ask them, are you sure? You yeah. Know, you sort of no. It's self-reflection. Yeah. So that was one thing. But I wondered whether you would tell us the story, because I like stories, Ajahn Brahm's story. Do you know the story he tells of the madman, the, the bloke whose wife sends him off to get eggs, yeah, or something? Would yeah. Just, because that is how often I protect myself when I'm attacked by someone who's really angry. I remember that story. 
okay. most things, unless everyone knows it because I find that really helpful yeah would, would you like to tell it no because you know it better than me oh my goodness okay <laughs> I have to try and remember that I can't tell it in all the detail the glorious detail that Adrian Brown does but it's basically this story it's very stereotypical okay because the woman's cooking mm. huh, and the man is obviously being asked to go out and buy it could be the other way around okay so yeah actually in my family my dad's cooking and shopping so that's tricky but <laughs> uh you know I'm too tired to turn it around. So what would it be? Okay, so the man's cooking, all right. So the man's cooking. And then he realises, oh, I don't have any eggs. So he says, darling, could you please go down to the market and get me some eggs, darling? Thank you. And his wife says, well, I don't know where the market is, you know. Um, please let, please tell me how to get there. So he draws a little map and he says, this is the way you go and walk around here and walk around there. And then you go to the market and just bring me six eggs back or whatever. So off she goes <clears throat> to the market. And uh, even before she gets all the way there, somebody starts shouting all these terrible things at his wife. You camel face, Poo, you stinky, stinky, smell like pee. And really abusing this poor woman as she's going down to the market just to get the eggs. And she gets so upset and so kind of horrified. She thinks, how can my husband send me to this terrible place? This is so unfair. This person doesn't even know me. How can they call me such horrible names? And I'm not stinky and I'm not camel face. <laughs> and, and and then she just turns around and walks back and then uh, the husband says uh, so did you get the eggs and she says how could you send me to that place no I didn't get the eggs these people are terrible they abuse you they argue with you they call you camel face and uh, and then the husband said well who was that oh this young man you know standing there and oh yes that person oh that person has a brain injury. They were like harmed in an accident many years ago. They're actually, um, uh, they have kind of a brain injury and, and they can't help it. You know, they do this to everybody. It's because they're not well. Um, mm. It's not only you, they, you know, they always do that. And, you know, you just walk past and understand that they mean well, really. So then, of course, She's like, well, hmm. and, <laughs> and she sort of forgets that she's got to go and get the eggs. So then the husband said, I still need those eggs. So, OK, goes back again. And this time, exactly the same thing happened. It probably got even worse. If it was Adrian Brown's story, it probably got very <laughs> colourful. And uh, <laughs> uh, but this time she just doesn't feel anything. There's no feeling of anger or frustration. On the contrary, she just thinks, what a shame. You know, this person was probably just like me doing well in life and then unfortunately they had this accident and now look all they can really do is sit around at the market and that's the only way they know how to connect you know mm. so the the attitude to that was completely different mm. when when she knew that this was not this person's fault uh, she knew this person was you know a sick person in a sense and this is again one of the ways that the buddha teaches is to um to overcome our anger to actually um, consider a person who is so stricken with ill will and with hate that uh, to consider them a sick person you know mm. to consider them as far away from you know quenching cool water far away from the dhamma and this is uh, you know this is not a good thing so we're not asked to pity them pity is not compassion but we may feel a rousing of compassion and a wish to help you know to provide that cool water of the Dhamma to actually just approach them with a little bit more understanding and kindness. And it didn't come as part of the story, but I would imagine that, you know, the fact that people just accept this person at the market probably makes him hang around, you know, and feel like he's got some friends somewhere to go. And who knows, even if you have a brain injury or whatever it is, it could, uh, it could help. It could help the healing. <laughs> So I think that's the story. And uh, of course, Ajahn Bram is the proper storyteller, but that's my little attempt. <laughs> so is there any last comment? Because we're almost through. So we're going to do the Dana talk pretty soon. But is there any anything else? One last question or comment? Or I don't know if Jane just had her hand up again. Did you? No. Is there anything that people would like to say in the question box? or? Send to me. 
I won't say your name if it's anonymous. <laughs> oh, it was really rich for me. I hope it was for you as well. We, it's great when we only get through a couple of suttas because actually, yeah, a couple of suttas, but uh, so much more. Really bringing them to life and making them relevant to our own experiences and sometimes just acting as a, as a kind of basis from which to have a much deeper discussion about the nuances of anger and the way to meet that anger kindly with compassion, with kindfulness, with mindfulness, yeah, restraint, always try to try to observe virtue because even I always believe, you know, and I always remind myself that no matter how I feel, even if sometimes I feel like mm, not really very happy or not quite sure if I'm doing the right thing, I always say, well, yeah, but no matter what happens in your life, you're still keeping really, really good virtue. You know, you're still living a really pure life. So clearly something, you're on the right track, you know, nothing's actually really going wrong. You're protected, right? Virtue protects you. So this is part of that restraint. And the um, reflection that I discussed is just an extension of restraint. It's uh, the mental restraint. It's also called Indriya Samvara Sila, which means um, guarding of the senses. It's like mental virtue. So we can restrain our body and speech, but we can also restrain our mind, not by telling ourselves, I mustn't have these thoughts, but by actually cultivating beautiful, positive thoughts as well. Right? That's part of Indriya Samvara Sila. It's a sila, it's a virtue, it's something beautiful. And the Buddha says that leads to blameless happiness. Actually, it's the general sila that leads to blameless happiness. And uh, Indriya Samvara Sila is called unblemished happiness, unblemished. So without spots, without dirty bits, just, just pure and bright. So we can keep our mind that way as far as we can, you know, without um, suppression, without... Uh, too much strain or without any shoulds but just through recognizing that whenever we do generate a wholesome positive generous compassionate thought we benefit there and then right and then of course the mindfulness which we've talked about a little bit and of course is talked about so much in general in the buddhist circles and the mindfulness scene and then this understanding you know that none of this is ours it doesn't belong to us in a sense it's not really our problem it's not really a problem it's just nature running its course it's the dhamma you know we have to awaken to the dhamma in its entirety understand how things arise and disappear that's the main thing it's not like is it good or bad it's how is it arising what is the cause for it to disappear that goes for all phenomena not only anger right it's not like we're trying to get into some heaven realm yeah, as Buddhists. I mean, if you want to, fine. That's okay. That's valid. But eventually we see that all of this experience through the senses is actually subject to fading and ceasing. And we start to work inside and, you know, go into the depths, the peace deep in the mind. So I'd like to open to Kelly to give a little closing talk. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Venerable Chanda, for this evening's sort of discussion. It's been really great to be back to our Friday night session and to see you all here in the Zoom room and hear your thoughts as well. So I'd like to say a few words about Dana, the practice of generosity. So today's sort of discussion is offered on a donation basis. And if you would like to offer Dana, your gift would be very much appreciated. Um, as always, it will continue to provide for Venerable Chanda's material needs, help her to continue to spread the Dhamma, and of course, it will support the setting up and development of the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK. So the link to the Anacampa website where you can read more, uh, both about the project and how to donate, uh, has been put in the chat box for you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> I know that some of you have written in also wanting to offer food and things like this. And just to say that um, right now I'm kind of in a bit of a transitionary space. So I'm in a temporary, uh, what do you call it? I mean, right now I'm here, so it feels very permanent, but I'm here for about um, one or two months. 
and it's actually the home of a friend who's got a very suitable dwelling in her garden it's like a cootie and uh, right now I'm in the office in the house like it's a, a bedroom that she's allowing me to use to do my zoom calls but uh, because it's her house and the kitchen's hers and everything I don't want to impose too much by having lots of guests but uh, there may be times when I will be able to and she's thinking actually of going away at some point in which case if I'm anywhere near you and you wish to come and offer Dana you're most welcome in person or also you know online that's fine so uh, yeah and it is an exciting time in the project so that's why we didn't want to like rent something longer term or buy something smaller at this stage. We want to kind of keep it quite open because I'm pretty used to being a little bit on the move. It's a bit more complicated with the project because I have like a full time job more than full time. And I do a lot of teaching as well. Uh, so it's a bit more complicated. I have a bit more than a backpack. <laughs> <laughs> I had loads of food actually with me that was from the cupboards in the last place so but that's anyway that shouldn't really be recorded but that's the way it is right now so <laughs> yeah so anyway it is an exciting time and as I say we went to Stroud uh, which is one possible area for our, our monastery a couple of days ago and uh, you know it's always good to visit places and see properties because it gives you a clearer idea about what's available, what would work, and you start thinking about community and the volunteers start thinking, hmm, I live near Stroud, what can I do? Could I get my friend involved, you know? <laughs> so it's not fixed on, you know, necessarily in that area, but that's definitely, I think it's kind of more middle of the country. I know it's quite west, but you know, a lot of people have written in and they say, oh yeah, I'll come if it's like half an hour away or 15 minutes away. And it's like, unfortunately we can't be 15 minutes from everybody because you all live in different places, but <laughs> we can try not to be in like, what's that bottom place at the end of Cornwall? Not Lan, Lan something, not Lanzarote, Lanza something, I don't know. Anyway, there's somewhere over there and there's somewhere in the north of, you know, England and Scotland, we're not doing that. So... <laughs> We try to find a peaceful place that's accessible. Land's End, okay, Land's End. <laughs> Not just England's End, but Land's End. <laughs> okay, so I shall let you go so that you're not late with whatever you next have to do. And thank you so much for coming. Remind everyone else to come next week. <laughs> Although it's nice to have a smaller group as well, but uh, if you have friends that were not here, remind them that it's on oh actually I should <laughs> forget that I'm actually not here next week okay sorry about that I'm visiting a very dear Dhamma sister for a couple of days only and it's like pure friendship <laughs> nothing to do with the project no emails nothing so yeah that's my little treat to myself but the two weeks from now will be the next sort of class tomorrow we have metta in the morning nine till ten and then we have the Wednesday chanting every Wednesday okay so it's all on the website, www.anukampaproject.org slash events. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Lovely to see you. Let's unmute you and then you can wave goodbye.